Part 18. Firebeard Wearily, Felix stepped through the entrance. This corridor seemed no different than the rest, save that the glowstones were all functional, and that the air smelled a little cleaner. The rest of the warband hastily pushed in behind, and the door swung shut behind them. Felix noticed that the dwarves of Karagdum relaxed visibly. Conversely, Gotrek, Snorri, and Varek appeared even more excited. He couldn't tell why, though. Maybe because they were getting closer to their goal. It was not a feeling that he shared. The long trek through the underholes had made him tense and nervous, and he just wanted to find a place to lie down and rest. This new corridor led into a winding maze of passageways. Every now and then, Hargrim stopped and pressed a panel on the wall. He gave no explanation as to why, he simply did it and moved on. Felix looked at Varek to see if the young dwarf could tell him what was happening. Uh, deadfalls? Pit traps? Defensive works of some sort, most likely? The dwarf said quietly, but he was silenced by a nasty look from their guardians. They passed maybe a dozen sentries at their posts, all of whom looked amazed at the sight of strangers from the outside world. Eventually, they entered a monstrously long hole, which was plainly inhabited by many dwarves. This was a huge place with many exits. A well had been sunk deep into the floor at the far end of the chamber. The ceiling was low, with none of the vaulting of the magnificent halls they had passed through en route. A forest of enormous squat pillars propped up the roof. On each pillar was inscribed a strange symbol, which hurt Felix's eye when he tried to read it. Runes of concealment, Varek breathed from beside him. No wonder this place has survived this long. What's that? Felix said. These runes protect the holes from magical seeking, just as the concealed entrance is protected from normal sight. This place would be all but impossible for one who was not a dwarf to find unaided. Felix could see hooded and cowled dwarf women working at their chores. A few priests strode backwards and forwards, speaking words of comfort and reassurance, patting heads, invoking blessings. There were many warriors as well, and a good number of them were crippled. Some had hooks, some stumped around on wooden legs, some had bandages over their eyes indicating that they were blind. Felix had never seen so many main people together in one place before, not even on the beggar-filled streets of Altdorf. It certainly looked like these people had come out on the losing end of a war. Nowhere did he see any children in evidence. So few, Varek muttered. This was once a great city. Welcome to the Hall of the Well. Wait here, Hargrim said. I will bring the news of your coming to the king. The captain strode off through a huge archway and vanished somewhere in the recesses of the city. Many of those that were working stopped and stared frankly at them. A few of the crippled beggars came over. One reached out and touched Felix disbelievingly. You are the first human ever to set foot in this citadel, he croaked. I am honored. Ah, you may soon be dead the crippled warrior said and turned away. The rest of the crowd moved in. One of the cowled women asked a question in Dwarfish, and Varek responded. The crowd emitted a collective gasp. One of the women burst into tears. They had asked where we had come from, said Varek, in answer to Felix's unspoken question. I told them we had come from across the waste, from the kingdom of the dwarves. I don't believe you said another greybeard, and turned and stalked away. It looked like there were tears in his eyes, too. As they waited, the crowd did not disperse. It surrounded them and stared at them until Hargrim returned, accompanied by a group of fully armored warriors, each of whom carried a rune-engraved weapon. Felix knew enough about dwarves by now to tell that these were magical, powerful weapons. These longbeards were the best equipped dwarves Felix had seen since entering Karak Doom. They marched with a precision that would have shamed even the Imperial Guard in Aldorf. Their armor was gleaming, 
and they moved with pride and discipline. The king will see you, Hargrim said. Now you will be judged. So we are to meet the legendary Fangrim Firebeard after all, Varric said. Who would have thought it? Gotrek laughed nastily. I have never seen so many rune weapons, Varric murmured to Felix. Every one of those warriors carries one. We collected them from the dead, Hargrim said coldly. There have been so many dead heroes here. King Fangrim's hall was vast. Huge statues of dwarf kings stood like sentries against each wall. More of the heavily armored warriors stood immobile between the statues. The four newcomers were surrounded by an escort of the king's guard. They were taking no chances of this being an assassination attempt. The weapons were drawn, and they looked as if they knew how to use them. A raised dais dominated the far end of the chamber. On the dais was a throne bearing a powerful and majestic figure wearing long robes over heavy armor. There were two priests flanking the king. One of them was a priestess of Valea. Felix could tell that by the fact that she carried a sacred book. The other was armored and carried an axe, and Felix wondered if this was a priest of Grimnir, the warrior god. As they came closer to the dais, Felix got a better look at the dwarfish king. He was old, as old as Borek, if not more, but there was nothing feeble about this one. He looked like an aged oak, gnarled but strong. The flesh had fallen from his arms, but still there were massive knots of muscle there, and his shoulders were even broader than Snorri's. His hair was long and red, although striped through with white. His beard reached almost to the floor, and it too was white in places. Piercing eyes glittered in deep-set sockets. Felix knew that this dwarf might be ancient, but his mind was still keen. The weapon that sat on the king's knees drew Felix's attention. It was a massive hammer with a short handle. Runes had been cut into the head, and something about them compelled the eye to look. He knew without being told that this was a weapon of awesome power, the legendary Hammer of Fate, which they had come all this way to find. The guard parted in front of them to leave a path leading only to the throne. The four comrades advanced. Varek went down on one knee, making florid and elaborate gestures with his right hand. Godric and Snorri lounged arrogantly beside him, making no sign of obeisance. Felix decided to err on the side of caution. He bowed low and then knelt beside Varek. You are certainly impertinent enough to be slayers, said the king. His voice was rich and deep, and surprisingly youthful coming from that ancient throat. He laughed, and his mirth boomed out through the chamber. I can almost believe that the cock and bull story you told Hargrim is true. No one calls me a liar and lives, Gotrek said. The flat menace in his voice caused the gods to raise their weapons in readiness. The king raised a mocking eyebrow. And very few indeed threaten me in my own throne room and live. Still, I ask your forgiveness, Slayer, if that is what you actually are. We are surrounded by the servants of the Dark Powers. Suspicion is only wisdom under these circumstances. You must admit that we have to be suspicious. That you have, Godric admitted. You have come to us claiming that you have voyaged here from the world beyond our walls. I would hear your tale from your own lips before I pass judgment. Tell it to me. I claim more than that, Varric said suddenly. I claim kinship with the folk of Karak Doom. My father was Varric, my uncle was Borek, whom you sent out into the world to seek aid. King Fangrim smiled cynically. If what you say is true, it took a long time for Borek to send any aid, and you do not represent much of an army. Still, tell your tale. The king listened attentively while Varric spoke stopping occasionally to ask confirmation from Godric. He told the tale simply and well, and Felix was astonished at the power of his memory. 
He also noticed that as the dwarf spoke the story, the eyes of the priestess of Valea never left them, and he remembered that the priestesses were supposed to have the gift of knowing the truth. At the end of the tale, the king turned to the priestess. Well, he said, they speak true, she replied. There was an audible gasp from the warriors in the chamber. The king raised his hand and scratched his chin through his fine long beard. He considered them for a moment and then smiled grimly. Now tell me, Slayer, how did you come by the axe of Valak? said the king. Godrek's answering smile was as grim as Fangrim's. Its owner had no use of it, being dead, so I took it. Do you have a claim upon it? The person who carried that blade from here was my son, Morekai. He sought to cross the waste and find out if anyone was still alive there. Then he is dead, Fangrim Firebeard. His corpse lay in a cave on the edge of the waste. It lay surrounded by the bodies of twenty beastmen. There was no one with him. He left here with twenty sworn companions. There was only one dwarf. I buried him according to the ancient rites, and being in need of a weapon at the time, I took this one. If it is yours, I will return it to you. The old king looked down and grief entered his eyes. When he spoke again, he sounded as old as he looked. So, he died alone at the end. He died a hero's death, Godric said. He paved his road to the iron halls with the bones of his foes. Fangrim looked up once more, and his smile was almost grateful. Keep the blade, Slayer. Such a weapon is not owned. It has its own doom, and it shapes the destiny of its wielder. If it is in your hands now, it is there for a reason. As you say, Godric said. And you have given me much to think about, Fangrim said wearily. And my apologies for doubting you. Now go, rest, we will talk again later. Prepare apartments for our guests, he shouted, and feed them with our finest. Felix couldn't help but notice that there was a note of bitter irony in the king's voice. Felix stared at the fish suspiciously. It was large and it looked well cooked, yet there was something strange about it. After a few moments' consideration, he realized it had no eyes. The meat smelled good and everyone else was eating it, yet he kept thinking of all the things he had seen in the chaos wastes of the mutants and the beastmen, and all the things he had been told about warpstone dust. He just could not bring himself to eat mutant fish, and he knew there was a good reason for this. By all accounts, it was possible for mutation to be passed on through eating mutated food. It was said that the worst mutants were always the cannibals who fed on the other mutants. He had no desire to put this theory of mutation to the test. It's just blind fish, man Lang said Godric from across the table. Felix realized that the Slayer must have seen the look on his face and understood what was going on in his mind. It is naturally this way. Dwarves have feasted on it long before the coming of the darkness. You can eat it safely. It is a delicacy, actually, Varric added. In the dwarf holes we breed them. They dwell in the deep cisterns. We feed them mushrooms and insects. Somehow this knowledge did not make the fish seem any more appealing. Unaware of the effect he was having, Varek continued to speak. They live in the darkness. Some lore masters believe that that is why they have no eyes. They don't need them. Do try some. Felix speared some on his knife and lifted the flesh up for examination. It was white and tender looking, and when he tried it, it was delicious. He said so. It can be monotonous, said Hargrim, who sat on the other side of him. We live on mushrooms and bugs and blind fish. There are times when I wish I could have something different. Felix dug into his pack and produced a strip of beef jerky. Hargrim looked at it just as suspiciously as Felix had inspected the fish. Try some of this, Felix said. Hargrim took some and began to chew. 
Eventually, he managed to swallow. Uh, interesting, he pronounced carefully. Snorri laughed. No, the blind fish doesn't taste so bad after all, does it? Here, try some of this to wash it down. Snorri handed over a flask of Kislevite vodka. Hargrim swigged it down. For one moment, he looked like he might actually cough, but then he recovered and smacked his lips and took some more. Ah, that's better, he said. Felix emptied his pack onto the table. There was whey bread and cheese and some more jerky. It added to the mushrooms cooked in blindfish oil, the blindfish itself, and the jugs of water. Help yourself, he said. Hargrim did so. With the speed that the provisions disappeared, Felix was glad that Hargrim was the only one of the local dwarves who had joined them at the table. Felix looked around the room. It was richly furnished, with thick but worn carpets and drapes, fine dwarven statuary, and the merchant's ransom in silver and gold. It was one of the royal apartments. Each of the comrades had been given a similar one. Felix supposed that that was one good thing about the casualties the dwarves had suffered. There was plenty of room. He pushed that thought aside as unworthy, and realized that he was getting drunk. I still cannot believe that we have strangers here, Hargrim said. From the flush on his face, Felix could tell that the captain was inebriated as well. It astonishes me. For so long we thought we were the last dwarves in the world. We thought chaos had overrun everywhere else. We sent out messengers and scouts into the wilderness, but they never returned. It all seemed so hopeless. And now you arrive and tell us that there is a whole world beyond the wastes, that chaos was thrown back, that the Empire and Bretonia and all those other places still exist. It hardly seems possible that the others have survived these past twenty years without us knowing it. Twenty years, you say? spluttered Felix and Varek almost simultaneously. I? Why do you look at me that way? It has been two hundred years since the last incursion of chaos. Hargrim looked at him in astonishment. That, that cannot be. Time flows strangely in the chaos wastes, Varek reminded them. Strangely indeed, said Felix, remembering what Borek had told him of the odd powers of the place. Could the dark powers warp even the flow of time, he wondered, or was this some strange property that the waste themselves possessed? Believe me, Varek said to Hargrim, here in Karak Doom only twenty years may have passed, but beyond the waste it has been centuries, and there chaos was thrown back. How did it happen? Magnus the Pious rallied men and dwarves to his cause, and broke the hordes of chaos at the siege of Prague in Kislev. Eventually, the followers of the Dark Ones were driven back to beyond Black Blood Pass. And yet, no one ever came to relieve us, said Hargrim, and he sounded almost bitter. Felix didn't know what to say to that. Everyone thought that Karak Doom had fallen. The last reports were of the city being overrun by the hordes of chaos. Gotrek surprised him by speaking. No one knew what had really happened. The chaos wastes had retreated, but they had still advanced beyond where they had once been. They always do. Karak Doom was cut off. No one could find a way through. It was tried, believe me. Borek sought long and hard for a way to return. I do believe you, Gotrek, son of Gurney, for I have seen the wastes. Looked out from our highest towers, and I know they stretch as far as the eye can see. I have fought the warriors of chaos, and know they are as uncountable as the flakes of snow in a blizzard. We have so few warriors that we soon stop trying to send messengers out. Many were captured and hideously tortured. How have you survived? Varek asked, somewhat tactlessly. Still, Felix was glad that the dwarf had asked the question. He wanted to know that for himself. Hargrim shook his head. With great difficulty, he said at last, and smiled wearily. 
But that is not a fair answer, my friends. The answer is that our foes are divided, and we hide and fight them as we may. What do you mean? Godric asked. Tell Snorri about the fighting, said Snorri. After the last great siege, when the forces of the enemy used terrible sorcery to break our walls, we retreated deeper and deeper into the mines, determined to sell our lives dearly and make them pay for every inch of dwarf territory with blood. Our people divided up into their clans and hosts and made their way to the secret fastnesses we had prepared against such a day. Like this one, Felix said. Precisely, we retreated under the earth to places shielded by ruins of power, and we emerged into the debated halls to raid and fight, and we discovered a strange thing. What was that? Godric asked. We found that the forces of chaos had fallen out with each other. We didn't know then, but we found out from captured prisoners that their supreme leader, Scatlock Ironclaw, had been drawn away to a battle in the south, and that his lieutenants, each of whom follow a different chaos power, had fallen into dispute over the spoils. When was this? asked Varek. Hargrim gave a date in Dwarfish which meant nothing to Felix. It was the Imperial Year 2302, Varek translated. At about the time of the Siege of Prague. If that was the case, why did you not drive them from the city? Asked Gotrek. Hargrim laughed and there was no mirth in the laughter. Because there were still so few of us left, son of Gurney. After the Great Siege we numbered less than 5,000, and those were split between five hidden citadels. Even with the majority of their warriors gone, our foes numbered ten times that, and divided though they were, we knew they would unite against us if we came out in strength. So, over the years, we learned to sally forth in small groups and pick away at our enemies. It was not a good strategy, as we would later learn. Why? asked Felix. Because for every one of their warriors that fell, another one would appear. For every warband we destroyed, two more would come. But when we lost a warrior, we could never replace him. We may have killed twenty for every stout-hearted dwarf we lost, but in the end we had no way of replacing our losses. And they did. I can understand this, said Felix. There are so many warriors out in the wastes and this is a worthy citadel and would provide them with shelter. Hargrim shook his head sadly. You do not understand the followers of Chaos all that well, if that is what you think, Felix Jaeger. They came here because there were treasures here, gold and dwarf-made weapons, and most of all the black steel they covered for making their own armor and the forging of their own foul weapons. They came here because they knew they would find others to fight of their own kind, and thus win glory in the eyes of their insane gods. This place has become a kind of testing ground for the warriors of chaos, where they can find others to slaughter in order to advance themselves. Hargrim's words did make sense to Felix. He had wondered on occasion where the chaos warriors got their weapons. He had seen no sign of foundries or factories or any kind of manufacturing since they entered the Chaos Wastes. Yet the followers of the Dark Powers must be getting their gear from somewhere. He had simply assumed that it was the product of sorcery or bartered from renegade human smiths. But here was another answer. Here at Karak Doom was ore and all the equipment produced by dwarfish industry. If some of the things he had heard were real, this single hold could produce more steel than the entirety of the Empire. He voiced his suspicions at once. You are correct, Felix Jaeger. We tried to destroy all the forges and furnaces and anvils we could not dismantle and carry into hiding, but we did not have the time to get rid of all of them. Some were seized by the followers of the ruinous powers. 
Some were repaired using black and incomprehensible magic. Now the mines are worked by hordes of beastmen and mutant slaves, and the mage priests oversee the manufacture of weapons and armor. If this place could be retaken, it would be a great blow to the forces of chaos. For where else could they get their weapons? Felix said in drunken excitement. Perhaps, perhaps not, Hargrim said. The chaos worshippers must have other mines and other foundries now, and empty as Karak Doom now seems, it is still being held. It is not now as it was in the early days. Many warriors of chaos have come here to hold their own small fiefdoms. There are whole towns in the underholds now, which are dedicated to the worship of one of the four powers of darkness. They exchange swords for slaves, spear points and arrowheads for food, armor for magical devices. You said there were other dwarf fastnesses in Karak Doom, Varric said. Gone now, Hargrim said. Over the years they have been wiped out. Those of their people that survived made their way here. Many did not. Many have been hunted down by the hounds of corn as they fled. Others would not come here, lest they led the followers of the Terror to our last haven. The Terror? Felix asked. Of that one it is best not to speak, Hargrim said. For it is our doom. When first it came, it took the lives of hundreds of warriors... Our rune master gave his life to drive it away. Now that it has returned, I doubt anything can stop it. Although your axe gives me some hope, Godric Gurnison. Felix's heart sank as he saw Godric and Snorri exchange a glance. He knew that Hargrim had aroused the Slayer's professional interest. Hargrim saw this too and shook his head. Tell me, what do you think King Fangrim is thinking about? Felix asked, just to change the subject. Do you think it is likely that he will send the new messengers to the outside world? I do not know, Felix Jaeger. I think it is likely that we will all die here. After that, there was silence for a minute, and then Godric spoke. I wish to know more of this creature you know as the Terror. That does not surprise me, Hargrim said looking up and inspecting the dwarf's tattoos. You wish to hunt it? I do. That would not be wise. It is not a question of wisdom. It is a question of my doom. And Snorri's, said Snorri. Spoken like true slayers, Hargrim said. Very well. I will tell you what I know of this fell creature. It is a demon of chaos. Potent and deadly. It was summoned by Scathlock in the last days of the siege, and he treated it not as a master treats a servant, but as a warrior treats a king. It came upon us at the southwest gate, after that was thrown down, and none of us could stand against it. It slew a dozen heroes armed with potent rune weapons. It almost killed King Fangrim himself when he faced it in the Hall of Shadows. They exchanged blows for just a moment, but it had the mastery. He could not believe its strength. Gartrek reached down and grabbed his axe. A gleam had come into his eye. It must be strong indeed to withstand the hammer of fate. Stronger than anything it is, Gartrek Gurnison. More fell by far than the three orc chieftains of the Red Fang. More dangerous than the three ogre mages of Venrag Heath. Deadlier even than the dragon Glaugir, for all its poison breath. I speak without boasting when I say I have stood beside my liege as he measured himself against mighty foes. But this thing was by far the mightiest. I doubt that even in the full pride of his youth, even so great a warrior as Fangrim Firebeard could have overcome it. Then how was it beaten? asked Felix, licking his lips nervously. How did you survive to tell us this tale? It was not beaten. It was driven away when our high runesmith Valek smote it with that sacred axe you carry, 
and then invoke the rune of unbinding. Such a wound it was, that anything but a creature so great would have died instantly. This thing merely withdrew into the deepest depths of the mountain, near the fiery heart. It must have brooded down for years, recovering its strength, for now it has returned, as it is prophesied. Prophesied? Even as it disappeared, it told us it would return to be our doom. It told the king that one day it will return, and tear out his heart with its claws, and devour it before his very eyes. And he told Fangrim that this was his doom. And all of us who heard it believed this prophecy, for there was a flat truth in its voice. It was a demon, Felix said softly. Demons are notorious liars. Aye, but this one gloated as it spoke, and we knew that it intended to work our ruin in its own time and way. Some of the warriors even suspect that this is why we have been allowed to survive this long. And our runesmith Valek also spoke a prophecy before he died. He told us to fear not, for the axe would also return to us when the last days came. Many of us wondered about this prophecy, for how could the axe return to us when it was destined to remain hidden in our fortress? Then the king's son took it, and we thought it lost. And lo, you have returned it to us, just a score of days after the terror returned. He looked meaningfully at Gotrek's axe. You see why your coming has disturbed the king? How did Valak invoke this rune of unbinding? Gotrek asked. I know not. He was a runesmith and knew many secrets. I only know that he summoned its power and it killed him, consuming his life even as it banished the demon. That axe you bear is old and potent beyond reckoning. It passed from runesmith to runesmith from the ancient days. Its full history was passed only from bearer to bearer, but with Valek's death the tale was lost. His son and apprentice fell before him in that final battle. The king's son, Morakai, took it from the runesmith's corpse and bore it away with him when he tried to cross the wastes. Then, without this rune of unbinding, the creature cannot be beaten? Felix asked. Who can say? That weapon is potent indeed, even without the rune of unbinding. Maybe in the hands of a warrior sufficiently strong... Describe this demon to me, Godric said. Hargrim leaned forward drunkenly and rested his chin on his fist. For a moment he smiled a smile empty of all humor, and then he sank into a reverie and gazed off into the distance, as if looking once more on a sight he would rather not see. Huge it was, he said eventually, more than twice the height of a tall man. Vast were its wings vast and bat-like, and when it unfurled them there was a crack like thunder. In one hand it bore a terrible whip, in the other an axe emblazoned with evil runes, which hurt the eye to look upon. Its eyes burned with infernal fire. Horns crowned its bestial head. On its brow was the mark of the blood god. As Hargrim spoke, a silence and a chill spread across the chamber. Felix began to have a terrible suspicion that he knew what the dwarf was describing. It was a creature that was hinted at in the old books he had read about the time of chaos. It was indeed a creature worthy to be known as the Terror. A blood grendrick, said Gotrek quietly. The bane of Grung, Varek mumbled, tugging nervously at his beard. A bloodthirster of corn, Felix whispered, and felt cold hands of fear touch his spine. He had just named the deadliest, most violent and implacable creature ever to emerge from the nethermost pits of hell, a demon second only to the dark god it served in its mythical powers of destruction, a being that even the mightiest would fear to face. Let's go and kill it, said Snorri. Let's have another drink first, Felix said, hoping to dissuade the slayers from this foolish quest for as long as possible. 
Felix awoke with the same strange feeling of disorientation which he had become quite familiar with over the last years. He was in a strange place, looking at a strange ceiling, and he felt somewhat nauseous. It took him a few moments to get his rebellious mind and stomach under control, and to work out where he was. When he managed to do so, he wished that he hadn't. He was deep underground in a chamber in a ruined dwarf citadel, somewhere deep in the chaos wastes. And he also had a hangover. Surely there were very few worse fates that could befall a mortal man, he told himself. He pulled himself up off the sumptuous but rather fusty smelling and too short a bed, pulled on his boots, and strode out into the corridor to find something that would settle his stomach. As he did so, he was greeted by one of the king's armored gods, who informed him that his presence was required in the throne room immediately. Felix realized that he had indeed found an even worse fate. Not only was he stuck in this terrible place, but he also had to face an old and irascible dwarfish tyrant on an empty stomach. Stifling a groan, he followed the guard. We cannot leave this place, said King Fangrim Firebeard. There are too many of us. According to what you told me, there is not enough room in your ship for more than a dozen people extra, at most. There are several hundred of my people here. It would be unfair to choose some to go and some to stay. Felix had to admit that the old dwarf had a point. He had arrived in the ruler's chamber only to find that the others were already being grilled by the old despot. Apparently, Varek had suggested that the people of Karak Doom should leave their ancestral home. Fangrim had raised a few cogent objections. It would only be a temporary measure, your majesty, Varek said. Once we had flown those people back to the Lonely Tower, we could return with a skeleton crew and take even more. We could continue to ferry them back and forth until we had taken everyone. It is possible. Maybe, but you have told me that even flying across the Chaos Waste is perilous. Maybe your ship will crash. Surely your majesty remaining here with the forces of chaos pounding upon your door is more perilous. It is only a matter of time before you are hunted down and destroyed. Varric was becoming impassioned and flustered. His eyes were large and round behind the lenses of his glasses. You do not understand, youngling. We have wives and wounded here. We cannot simply abandon them or send them away with a small escort. You know how perilous the halls are. You have seen them. It would take many warriors to guard them, and there is not enough room on your ship for them and the escort. The escort could return to the halls, Varek said. They are warriors. They have done this before. Your point is a fair one, but eventually we would have to move our ancestral hordes. These are not small treasures. And not a gold piece or trinket will I leave behind for the despoilers. Felix spoke up for the first time. But surely gold means nothing when the lives of your people are concerned, your majesty. Every single dwarf present turned to look at him as if he was either deranged or profoundly stupid. No one even bothered to answer him. Felix wished the floor would open up and swallow him. He should have known better than to try and make a rational argument to dwarves when gold was being discussed. Could we carry away our father's treasures on your small ship? Fangrim asked. From what I have heard about your hoard, may it ever grow and prosper, I doubt it. Then how can you expect us to leave this place when we still have blood in our veins? Maybe we could return with more than one airship, Great King, Varek said. Perhaps we could return with enough craft to carry all your people and your horde. If you could do that, I would see that you were suitably rewarded. Let me think on what you have said. You may go. Varek rose to go, and Felix moved to join him. He felt a vague sense of relief at being about to leave the king's presence and the prospect of getting some food. Fangrim Firebeard, Godric said. I crave a boon. Tell me what this is, Godric Gurnison. 
I wish to seek out this creature you call the Terror, and either slay it or find my doom. King Fangrim smiled down at Godric and appeared to consider the request. At that moment, however, a distant horn sounded. A few heartbeats later, a dwarf raced through the entrance of the throne room and advanced at once to the king. Fangrim gestured for the messenger to come closer and then listened to the whispered words. When the new arrival had finished speaking, his face looked grim indeed. It appears it will not be necessary for you to seek the monster out, Godric Gurnison. It is coming here, now, and it brings with it an army. Just wonderful, thought Felix, and I haven't even had a chance to grab a meal.